going around the area, attending as many community uh, groups as we can. We've met a, a wonderful uh, number of, of people, and this is our this isn't the end of our public information engagement period, but it is the last of the three formal information sessions, the one we're doing here in Pickering. And it's a uh, Parks Canada really takes public engagement very seriously. And we want to hear uh, what you have to say. We want to hear the hopes you have for the park. We want to hear your concerns as well. And it, we're certainly uh, hearing a, a lot from a lot of people about what's happening now. And uh, certainly there's been years and years of, of stewardship. Uh, so many people uh, in the room here have played such an integral role. Tonight we want to thank uh, the City of Pickering, uh, the Pickering uh, City Council, and I know we have two councillors here, uh, Councillor Rodriguez and Councillor O'Connell. Now, I didn't meet Councillor O'Connell yet. Oh, there you are. Uh, good, good to have both of you here this evening. And I know the Mayor, uh, Dave Ryan, sends his regrets. I've certainly met him uh, in the last uh, few weeks. Um, we also, I think, want you to feel that this public engagement is, is the way we want to build that, that solid foundation uh, for the National Urban Park. It is just really the start of the conversations that we hope to have with all of you as we move forward to the future. And uh, this evening we'll be having some refreshments after, and Richard's going to be up in a minute to tell you the format for the evening. Um, there are a number of Parks Canada people in the room, though, besides me, uh, Pambino. We have Louis Lavoie and, and uh, Diane uh, Prello at the back, and uh, we also have Richard, who will be up in a minute, Richard Scott. John Meek has been uh, managing our engagement process. He's here, and Carrie Spink is uh, outside at the registration desk, and Andrew Campbell, the Vice President of uh, External Relations and Visitor Experience for Parks Canada has, has been a bit delayed getting in from Ottawa, but he should be here shortly. So tonight, really, our objectives are to share the park concept with you, and I'll be coming back to do a presentation, and to respond to some general questions or to hear some of your comments. Uh, we want to open the door for opportunities for you to continue to engage in the park, uh, and also if those of you who want to start uh, to engage in the park. And we, as I mentioned, we really are here uh, to listen. And so with that, I'm going to turn it over to Richard, who will go through the format, and then I'll be back up in a minute. Thanks, Matt, and uh, welcome, everyone. Uh, glad to see this. Uh, we've had good turnouts at all the meetings, and tonight is no exception, so we're very happy that you're here tonight. Uh, we're scheduled to be here for approximately two hours. Uh, if our track record in the other meetings uh, is any indication the conversations we've had with you folks on a one-on-one -on -one basis, uh, will take us uh, longer than that. Uh, the agenda is broken down into two parts. The first part is scheduled for about an hour, and as Pam mentioned, she'll do a presentation on the park concept and how we got to the park concept. And uh, well, that will be followed by about a half hour period of questions for, uh, and comments, clarifications that uh, you can address uh, to uh, Pam and others, park staff, uh, up here at the front. We'll have two people, uh, Diane and Lou, and uh, Carrie will be walking around with uh, remote mics, so we will, uh, come to you uh, with the mic so you can ask your questions. And we'll probably work one, we, the seats are broken up into three sections, so we'll just work our way section by section and then repeat. So uh, you just have to put up your head and we'll keep track of who uh, who's, uh, wants to ask a question. Uh, following the, uh, the question period, we will then have about 45 minutes or longer for informal conversations uh, with you. Uh, and so we can do that either in here, out in the foyer, or both, whichever, uh, wherever we want to congregate. Uh, we do have at the tables outside, as you came in, most of you saw that there were iPads uh, with surveys, the online survey. Uh, for those of you that want to fill out an online 
Land Survey. We have green cards that will take you can take with you, and uh, that will direct you to the website and to the online survey as well. So we really do encourage you to fill out that survey. We've had hundreds and hundreds of people uh, providing input, and the survey really allows us to organize what all of you are saying so that we can maximize uh, our understanding of what uh, the communities out around the park are saying to us. Uh, we hope to wrap up around nine. Uh, that may be, uh, we're starting a little bit late, and uh, as I said, we may expand the conversations. The treats will be outside as well, I think beginning at eight o'clock. And uh, we also have, uh, I think John has a camera, so we uh, would like to take a few general photographs just for the record of tonight's session. Uh, no up close photos will be taken, but if you have any concerns, we prefer not to be in a photo of any kind, uh, please let John uh, let know. Uh, washrooms are uh, to the left, out the doors, and sort of straight ahead and mid to the left. And uh, as I mentioned, coffee and cookies will also be available. So in terms of tonight's session, uh, we don't expect everyone to have read the concept. Uh, it is on the website. We do have copies here. We do have a one-page summary as well. Uh, but Pam will provide an overview of the park concept, a thumbnail sketch of what is in the concept document. Uh, there are many other topics related to the park as well, in addition to the concept, that is planning. Uh, again, the online questionnaire will provide you an opportunity to comment on other elements of the park that we may not cover tonight uh, in the presentation. So with that, I will uh, turn it over to Pam, and uh, we'll get the presentation started.
working career. And it's, for those of us involved, uh, we're a family of staff. We're also a family of, of protected heritage places around the country. We have uh, 43 national parks. We have 167 National Historic Sites that we're responsible for, and we have also four National Marine Conservation Areas. And uh, we are the oldest National Park Service in the world. We had our 100th anniversary in 2011, and uh, we believe that we bring uh, leadership in both conservation uh, and tourism uh, to bear. And of course, uh, this won't be a national park, it won't be a national historic site, or a national marine conservation area. This is a new concept, as I said, a national urban park, so it will be the first uh, of its kind in the country. We are also uh, one of the largest uh, federal land managers in the country, and we administer 320,000 kilometers uh, of land. And of course, we are habitat and home to a number of wildlife species. We also even have communities that, that are inside national parks, as well as adjacent to national parks. And uh, in 2011, uh, on the occasion of our anniversary, we were afforded the uh, World Wildlife Fund International's Gift to the Earth Award for us as an organization. Now, on May 25th, 2012, uh, the federal government uh, did announce funding uh, in uh, of uh, $143.7 million over the next 10 years for park development and implementation, and uh, also a budget of $7.6 million for an operating budget uh, thereafter. Of course, the idea of a national urban park was first mentioned in the speech from the throne, and uh, then, of course, uh, the funding announcement came in the 2012 budget. And uh, some of you have said, okay, we have now a national urban park. We don't actually have that yet. That hasn't been established. Uh, you're going to hear in a little bit that we are working towards establishment, but this requires special legislation, and so that has to be developed. And obviously, this concept and strategic plan for the park uh, has to be uh, developed as well. Parks Canada does not uh, have title to the land, and, and uh, that's another reason why we don't yet uh, have the National Urban Park. But I think uh, I really want to stress again that uh, we're not coming in and starting from scratch or starting from, uh, 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 from nothing. Uh, this place has been here. It's been protected for many years. Uh, the lands uh, have been set aside. They're used by many of you in the room. You know, those of you who live on the park uh, edges of, of the current park and, and the boundaries of the proposed new National Urban Park, those of you who dedicated more than 30 years, some of you, uh, for protection of this place and for its uh, future for our, our children and our grandchildren. I mean, I certainly salute you and I hope that Parks Canada, well, what we will do is, of course, build on that work and continue to work with uh, all of the stakeholders and, and all the levels of government who uh, are involved. What, you, what we has been developed now uh, is what we call a park concept. It's actually a vision and broad overview of how the park will be established, protected, and managed. It really describes uh, the area of the proposed park, the study area as we're calling it, uh, how the park will be governed, managed, both in the interim and into the future, uh, what will occur from a prevention, law enforcement, uh, strategies, visitor experience, conservation, and so on. And it really highlights the engagement process uh, that we're in at this stage and how we see everything going on into the future. And uh, as I mentioned, not only was, uh, was uh, input from stakeholders and the public instrumental in creating the concept to date, but it also is instrumental in us uh, taking the concept further towards a strategic plan. So uh, if this is what the concept is, and as John mentioned, uh, or Richard mentioned, it's online. We have 
copies outside. Some of you will probably have read it cover to cover. It's a quite a short document. It won't answer all your questions, and it certainly won't uh, identify everything that the park is going to be, because obviously that's what we're here to shape. But what we've done is taken all the input from about 100 different stakeholders, and we've uh, brought that together into the, the park concept document. We also brought uh, together uh, not only uh, community and uh, other stakeholders, but First Nations were involved, uh, and everyone has worked to form the concept of it stand, as it stands at the moment. Uh, we've had uh, a vision, visioning sessions. That's how the vision was created, uh, not Parks Canada, you know, sitting behind a desk somewhere. Uh, we worked with uh, a number of you and others uh, to create the vision for the park, and then that also uh, has formed the backbone of the concept. And now what we're doing is taking the concept out for public input. Um, obviously, in addition to those of us who, you know, may be uh, in, in my generation, one of the things that Parks Canada is really serious about is connecting to the next generation and the next generation of stewards. It's really our young people, our youth, who are going to carry on the values and the ideals that we hold. Uh, but a lot of them are, are, have become maybe what I could say disconnected from nature. Uh, they don't often get the opportunities. Uh, they don't often get the opportunities to be out in the outdoors. Uh, and yet it's so important uh, for, for uh, continuing on the concept of stewardship that not only has developed here, but has developed in other parts of the country. So one of the groups that we engaged were actually uh, students and youth. And, and uh, back in uh, February of this year, Parks Canada and U of T Scarborough campus hosted a youth workshop that included um, a, a number of, of people, uh, young people, 65 in all. They ranged from high school to university students. They came from places like uh, University of Toronto, Centennial College, Dumbarton High School, Malvern Family Resource Centre, Scarborough storefront, the YMCA, and 4-H Ontario, and they gave us their perspectives, and it's always interesting to hear from youth, uh, because sometimes we presume to know what any of us want, and until you listen and hear, you don't always know. The vision, I mentioned it earlier. So this idea of a people's park, and you'll have heard it a lot in uh, some of the media uh, articles and reports. You'll have heard us talking about it. Uh, others have talked about a people's park well before us. And this really underpins and is the underlying vision and concept for a, a national urban park. It's this opportunity for people to connect to learn, to have meaningful experiences, and to become stewards and carry on this responsibility. Uh, so when you start with a vision, you start with this idea of a people's park. And so the park is to celebrate and protect for current and future generations a diverse landscape in Canada's largest metropolitan area. It's to link Ontario with the Oak Ridges Moraine and to offer varied and engaging opportunities to really be inspirational in terms of, of um, connection to both the natural beauty but also the wealth of cultural history which uh, you know it abounds here whether we're talking about First Nations or whether we're talking about our wonderful farming heritage in the area or, uh, or uh, other settlement patterns and, and residents today so this idea of protecting both the natural and, and cultural heritage. Um, also to promote a vibrant uh, farming community. And those of you who've attended some of the other sessions, you know, um, right now I'm the superintendent of Banff National Park. We don't have working farms in Banff National Park. And in fact, uh, uh, elsewhere in our, our organization, and the idea that we have such a, a vibrant working living area, uh, I think that was what uh, attracted me, one of the things that attracted me to come here. And also, of course, this 
bigger ideal that we have as Canadians and as part of Canada that we can use uh, this park, this national urban park, to really inspire people to understand the, the family of national parks, national historic sites, uh, national marine conservation areas, and other protected areas in the country. Because nowhere else do we have this opportunity to touch the 20% the, the of the Canadian population. Uh, that doesn't mean that all 20% of the Canadian population may be visitors of the National Urban Park, but what it means is we have this opportunity to do inform, to educate, to engage, and really turn people on to the system of protected areas and create this next generation of stewards. Now, the, the National uh, Urban Park really is going to be, um, as I said, very different and innovative. And we see four really pronged areas in, in terms of, of the, the different components. We, and so this is what you'll see up behind me in terms of these uh, bubbles that intersect. The idea of connecting people to nature and history, to support a vibrant farming community, to conserve natural heritage, and to celebrate a cultural heritage character. And it doesn't mean that any one of these things takes precedence over the other, but they are all connected. And this together is uh, what makes up the foundation of the concept. And it's really this gathering place that offers opportunities from the south to the north for people to connect through conservation, education, recreation, and vibrant, sustainable farming. And so uh, we'll have you know, resources that are conserved. We'll have the wonderful stories of conservation, volunteering, and stewardship that will be told. And then those people who connect with this place will, in turn, create their own stories, which will, they will pass on to others. Now I'm going to go into each of these uh, a little bit in terms of these four areas. So uh, in terms of connecting people to nature and history, there's a lot going on right now. I'm amazed at the number of volunteers the Rouge Park staff have done tremendous work in terms of the programming that's available. Many of you who are here tonight are avid hikers in the area, or you're working with organizations like the Friends of the Rouge and other uh, Rouge Valley Foundation and other organizations to really get out there and uh, do your part. Uh, also to get out and enjoy. And so this concept of connecting people to nature and history will carry on. However, things like the National um, Historic Site of Beat Hill are perhaps less well known or less uh, told in terms of stories. So this idea of really connecting people to the history of the area and the nature is really an important part of the concept. Um, also, uh, there are cases where there aren't as uh, good connections as perhaps there need to be, whether it's trail system uh, or even a connection in stories, and that's the type of thing that we see uh, being uh, better in terms of, of connect connectivity. Also, uh, some of the facilities are working well. There's not that many facilities. You know, we're not talking a large, uh, large scale, scale facility development at all. But we will need some areas uh, to help service uh, the visitors and provide that level of service that on, not only visitors are looking for, that certainly Parks Canada is known to do and known to do well. Um, I've often had the question, are we going to have to pay to enter a place that we already can visit for free? So we're here to tell you this is one decision that's been taken, is that there will be no entry fee to visit and enter the Rouge Valley National Urban Park. Uh, there may be fees for, well there already are fees for camping and there will be continue to be fees for camping. And there may be uh, special programs that have to be offer it, offered as a, at a fee. But certainly in terms of entry, this will be very different than our national parks and national uh, historic sites uh, today in terms of, of no entry fee. Also, uh, in the concept, you'll read a, a lot about the idea that th this is a, a large area. Uh, there are, are many uh, spots where people sort of enter and exit to uh, enjoy the park. Uh, we have this idea, the stakeholders uh, have helped develop this idea of hubs or land 
Landings, as the First Nations uh, prefer to call uh, these areas, where people will enter, they will become uh, aware of what's available, they will receive education or interpretation, and uh, uh, we have not made any uh, decisions really about where exactly these areas will be, but there are some natural areas, as you know. And this will really help to create a sense of arrival to the, to the National Urban Park. You know, we, we kind of laugh sometimes because those of us who uh, work in national parks like Banff, uh, we think everyone knows what Banff National Park is. But in fact, many people come in and they really don't know that they've entered a national park. And if they don't know that they, they have that sense of arrival, how can we expect them to understand what a national park Park, or in this case, a national urban park will be all about, about. So it's really important for us to touch people through a sense of arrival. We also, uh, as far as connecting people to nature and history, we want to perpetuate and continue that wonderful tradition of volunteers. I was astounded uh, when I was looking at coming here to hear that there were 7,500 volunteers uh, who, who provide their level of service, their level, level of expertise in the park. And that's phenomenal. We want to see that continue. We also, as I talked about, use stewardship to get that next generation of stewards. And of course, one of the things that Parks Canada, I think, is known for and we really as well take seriously is the idea that you would have a safe and enjoyable visit while you're here. This, this park as well has an amazing tradition of, of conservation through all the work of uh, a variety of stakeholder organizations uh, operating for many years through the current work that's going on. The National Urban Park will require a very innovative conservation approach because we obviously are in a different type of landscape altogether here. And because we're in that urban environment, that idea of coming up with something that's unique to this area and very innovative in its approach. However, we see it being uh, founded in, in four main areas. The idea that we have both the terrestrial and the aquatic ecosystems to conserve. Uh, we want uh, that uh, conservation approach to build on the existing stewardship efforts. We have 23 species at risk in, that we know of uh, in, in the park uh, as it exists today. And of course, Parks Canada is responsible uh, as all federal entities uh, to uh, conserve uh, species at risk. So this will be an important part of the approach. And because uh, obviously we don't know everything and we want to learn from others, we will draw on best practice, practices from not only within our own country, but also internationally as well. Now I talked earlier a little bit about the heritage character, uh, the cultural heritage character. And certainly uh, we have an amazing number of resources above and below ground. There's certainly many, many archeological sites. Uh, Bead Hill is one. Uh, there are heritage buildings. Uh, there are cultural landscapes. And so it's very important to connect people to this idea of, of the cultural landscape. Uh, people connect uh, uh, to human history. So this idea of using the human component to connect people it is a very important part of the concept. And certainly as we develop uh, this aspect, we'll be looking at um, how do we ensure that heritage buildings continue to be uh, used in a financially sustainable manner, uh, because obviously when things are used, they, they tend to be preserved better. Uh, we'll have to we'll be looking towards the community and other organizations to help safeguard and celebrate the local built heritage. Uh, Bee Hill, most people don't even know it exists. Uh, it is a national historic site, and yet there is no plaque or there's nothing there to interpret the site to visitors. First Nations don't just want to be involved, though, at Bee Hill National Historic Site. They also want to be involved elsewhere in the park, so we're working with them on their ideas. And, of course, uh, looking at how we interpret the low-ground resources to visitors as well. Because we really have thousands of years of heritage here, and then, of course, more recently, uh, 200 years 
of, of uh, settling and farming the land. And of course, uh, speaking of uh, farming, the, that 200 years of agricultural history, it's an essential part of the park's character. It's an important land use today. There's actually 75 working farms now uh, in the park area, and that makes up about 60% of the land base. Um, the farmers, of course, are dedicated to the land. They also are producing now environmental farm plans. That idea, we would hope to continue and, and grow that, that concept of sustainable farming. And obviously, visitors will want to get exposed and learn about the farming heritage. So obviously, uh, interpretation, selective interpretation of areas that can be uh, available for visitors will be important. And uh, you know, one of the things that we've been doing as well is starting uh, to work uh, collaboratively with the farming community on what they see for the future of the park as well. Now, because this is a new idea, it, we also need to take an innovative management approach. And so uh, that's why uh, its, it's urban setting really does uh, require uh, a special approach. There has to be flexibility to accommodate uh, urban area, urban land uses, and to obviously integrate and promote agriculture as a part of the park. So we, in the concept, We've outlined three main areas in terms of the way we would look at managing a park in different areas. One would be park areas, uh, second agricultural areas, and the third would be the infrastructure and built assets. And here I'm talking specifically about the transportation and communication corridors, the road systems, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And the park areas uh, are areas that will be managed both for protection uh, and uh, recreation, as well as education. Uh, agricultural areas, places to demonstrate sustainable farming, uh, also to have natural buffers and have experience-based uh, activities. And then, of course, the infrastructure and built air assets areas would be to allow for the road system, the communications, and the transportation systems to, to move freely. But what this means is not uh, taking each of these in isolation, but that means us taking a very integrated approach. And that's something that Parks Canada uh, deals with everywhere in our organization. We look at protection, education, and visitor experience, and our decision making integrates these three things in our Parks Canada mandate. And these three areas that you see up here will be uh, uh, a case as well where we'll have to integrate our decision making as we move forward. The study area, I mentioned that we would, uh, we would touch on this as well. And uh, the study area, which is uh, a little larger than the current, the current uh, Rouge Park is 47 square uh, kilometers. The study area is 60 square kilometers. And uh, not only do this, th does this make us the largest uh, urban park in North America, it also fulfills the original vision for a contiguous network of natural lands and open spaces following the Rouge Valley from Lake Ontario to the Oak Ridges Moraine. And certainly the uh, stakeholders that have been discussing this idea to date, along with the landholders table, which I'll talk about in a minute, the, this is the group that came up with the study area. And uh, this is uh, the idea that certain things will be included uh, in the, the area for the park. There are no boundaries that have been set. You have notional boundaries uh, in the concept document and in the study area. But this idea that things will be included or excluded. For example, all private land holdings, even if they are within that big rope line boundary, are excluded from the park, so are transportation corridors and so on. And obviously, it's our urban environment that requires flexibility. Uh, 
the zoo is also, uh, while adjacent to the park boundary, is excluded, as is the Bear Road landfill, and as I mentioned, private land holdings. We, however, will work with all the uh, adjacent land owners, uh, whether they're different levels of government or private land holders, uh, in a cooperative spirit, because obviously we, we are in this together. And I'm just going to flip up the map here. Um, and for those of you who may have been at one of our other sessions or who will have your copy of the concept, uh, this map is slightly different. Only then uh, it became clear that we weren't very clear when it came to some of the private land holdings. So we hopefully uh, made it so uh, that the private land holdings, which are excluded, are better seen in this map. But the boundaries uh, remain the same. Now I mentioned I would uh, speak a little bit to transition because obviously the, everything isn't going to stand still and wait for uh, uh, the transfer of land to Parks Canada and Parks Canada to take over as the, the land manager. We have a, a park here, we have lots going on and so we've taken um, and put in place measures to ensure a smooth transition along with interim governance during both the establishment process and the time when we develop and implement our strategic plan. So, and uh, a couple of weeks ago, uh, we were able to confirm that the Toronto and Region Conservation Authority, TRCA, uh, will be responsible for interim management of the, of the park. Um, and uh, also, as I mentioned, uh, the transition will, will take a little time. Uh, the current calendar year we're in, as well as the start of 2013 and into the 2013-14 uh, fiscal year. So uh, we're not setting hard and fast dates. We're in the first phase right now of transition. As I mentioned, uh, Parks Canada uh, has a, an assignment agreement to keep on the, uh, the Rouge Park staff. Uh, they do great work. I know uh, uh, some of them are here tonight, and I want to thank them publicly for everything they do. So they will be uh, working as part of the TRCA and will continue to deliver on the good programs that they have been delivering on. Uh, as title changes and lands come to Parks Canada and the, uh, the park is established, then we'll move through phases two and three, and then the final phase, of course, phase three, is where uh, the, the land is in federal hands and Parks Canada will uh, uh, be manage, managing the, the urban park. Uh, the other thing that we've done uh, to ensure good governance during this transition period is that uh, the minister, Minister uh, Peter Kent, is appointing a number of people to a transition advisory committee. And that uh, committee will advise Parks Canada uh, on uh, the interim management, uh, obviously working with TRCA and Parks Canada. And the membership on that group will reflect the diversity of interests uh, that we have in the area now. And this transition advisory committee will uh, stay in place uh, and advise us on both establishment, interim management, uh, till uh, we have a strategic plan and are able to start implementing that. Now, this shows you the process that we're actually almost through at this point. Uh, it, has, it has really uh, two parallel processes. Uh, one deals really with the land, and the other deals with the, the vision and the concept and the, the strategy. But both will lead to recommendations to government on both the legislative process and in final steps of establishment along with the management direction for the future. So in terms of the land, a landholders table uh, committee was set up, obviously all the levels of, of government and others who looked at things like the study area and also are working towards uh, another step on this side and that is an agreement for the assembly of the lands leading to the transfer of lands to Parks Canada. And so that, I'm going to turn here and try this 
situation. So if you see over here, you'll see all the players who've been around this table. Uh, we have uh, the, all the municipal governments, the Rouge Park Alliance were there as well, as well as the TRCA. And so we're moving, we move through this period, we're in, we have this, what we're doing now is working on the agreement for land transfer. That doesn't mean that all of the land will be transferred this fall, but uh, we're working towards agreement for that to happen. And that in turn goes down in terms of the recommendations to government and in terms of legislation. Then likewise, the other side, which is dealing with the, the creative side of things in terms of the concept and the uh, strategy, is uh, all of these things started to happen in November in terms of active steps of working with stakeholders, uh, working with First Nations, going through that, the visioning, getting to the planning process, or through planning process to the concept. Um, we then took that back out to the stakeholders and First Nations. Now we're in the stage down here in terms of public involvement of getting input. And it's this summary of input that will then make us go to the next stages of developing a strategic plan. And, uh, you know, really that's where the detail will come on, on what the park is and, and how it will uh, operate and be managed. So there, there are lots of opportunities for you to engage. Some of you are already highly engaged. We launched our public engagement program on June the 25th. It will continue formally until seven, uh, September 17th. We're using many, many different vehicles. Um, Richard talked about the online survey. Very important. We've got cards up there, the iPads, if you want to, to do your survey. We've had hundreds and hundreds of surveys filled out. We've had uh, records of all the comments that we're getting at these info sessions. Uh, we're meeting with a lot of community residents at the picnics and uh, other sessions. We did Guildwood uh, Arts and Crafts. Uh, we've been, we're going to do a seniors breakfast this week. We're trying to uh, get out to as many places and meet with as many people as we can. And all of that will actually come into play and be recorded and, and we'll be uh, looking at the responses and the information. We'll be uh, looking at what it's telling us and that in turn will shape uh, the creation of the strategic plan. So with that, I believe I have come to the end of my part of the presentation. And uh, now I will uh, I'll invite my fellow Parks Canada staff to maybe join me down here. Um, it certainly feels like a very formal environment. Uh, it's funny, uh, when I worked as a superintendent of Lake Louise, Yoho, and Kootenai, I actually, I guess, technically was the mayor of places like Lake Louise and Field because those communities are run by Parks Canada. But I've never been a mayor in terms of a municipal situation. And now I kind of have a bit of a feel of what you guys as councillors uh, feel like when uh, you're at a podium like this. But anyway, thanks very much for your attention. I hope I didn't talk too long or too quickly. But now we'll open it up for questions. And Diane and Carrie have microphones. And I guess we're going to start here on this side, Richard. We'll make our way over and then keep, keep uh, organizing it that way. Thanks. And Andrew Campbell's joined us as well. Thank you. I'm not sure that recreation might might be exactly where we're going, but we certainly do want to interpret it. And what exactly what shape that takes, we we haven't uh, decided that yet. But again, that is something that we really. Site, and we want to have people understand 